very, very special episode with the Green Show Learning Trust book club again, uh, discussing this massive book, uh, <laughs> Conceptual Maths. And this is live, Match at Live. You can, of course, hear the recording. And uh, it's interactive as well. It's kind of like responsive teaching. So if you are uh, out there on uh, mostly on Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, or YouTube, something comes to your mind, do comment. Uh, do please retweet this so, uh, that, so that other people can see this as well. Twitter's kind of messed up the timeline, so please do retweet. Um, so we'll just do a very quick round of introduction and we'll um, get uh, get straight into it. So I'm Atul, I'm the host of Math Chat Live. I'm a online tutor teaching uh, both uh, primary and secondary um, students um, all over the world, international syllabuses, GCSE, etc. And I'm uh, based in London. So um, over to uh, Dave. Hi, I'm Dave Tushu, a lead practitioner in Bristol. Um, massive fan of the book, really looking forward to, to talking more about it. Um, so much in here, Pete, that we could go through. Um, and, uh, and although we picked a particular chapter in here, um, I'm really, really looking forward to just where the conversation goes and, uh, and, and learning loads from the conversation. So thank you so much for having us here. My pleasure. And uh, your debut, Lisa? Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Lisa. I uh, currently work for the Inspiration Trust as their primary maths lead. So I oversee the maths um, in all of the six primary schools in the Trust. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to uh, put a primary spin on uh, conceptual maths. Great. Uh, and your debut as well, Carleen. Hi, I'm Carleen Masson. Uh, I work for Anthem Trust um, and I oversee the five secondary schools maths departments that we have within there. Uh, I've worked with Pete a couple of times over the last couple of years, so really looking forward to delving into this book. And your debut as well, Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Lee. I'm the regional lead practitioner for the West Midlands of Ormiston Academies Trust. So we currently have 43 schools within our trust and there's around nine in the West Midlands that I work closely with. Great. And of course, Pete. <laughs> yeah, I'm Pete Mattock. I don't do trust things. I just stay in one school as an assistant principal now. Uh, but of course, the reason I am here, Atal, I'll just show it again, is because I am the author of Conceptual Maths and I'm really looking forward to hearing about what others have taken away from it and having read it or having at least read part of it. Because I don't know if anybody, it's only been out a month, and I don't know if that's long enough for anybody to read the whole thing to be fair um and yeah so and, and you know discussing aspects of, of the things that i've written and, and why i wrote them and why i think they're important so yeah that's me i'll just add that that's a follow-up uh visible mass for the previous book as well so they're like uh, the two the two big albums as we would say in the world of uh, music um and uh finally over to host uh, rhiannon Hi, I'm Rhiannon Rainbow. So I am School Improvement Lead for the Greenshaw Learning Trust, um, 14 secondary schools, and I'm starting to do some work um, uh, working with our colleagues in primary as well, which is brilliant. And it just reminds me of how much I need to learn, even though that's what I trained in. It is a number of years ago since I trained in that and, and things do move on really quite quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm hugely grateful to everybody for their time today and, and to Pete as well, because Dave and I, co-founders of the GLT Book Club, um, and we're connecting with people here that we've met on Twitter and all sorts of other things that we've done. It's been absolutely brilliant community to have been a part of, which I only really joined in the last couple of years. So um do get involved do do tune in do ask questions it's brilliant and i'm also going to have a nod to karen hancock so she is live sketch noting this session for us as well so that can be shared afterwards i know how popular those are as as the one pages with with an overview of the discussions and I am going to start um, with a little bit more as well and i'm going i'm going to link back so i'm going to link back to almost two years ago so two years ago on the 26th of January 2021 was our third book club session, which was held with Pete Mattock as our guest. On You're not his telling book, this story again, are you? On, on his book, Visible Maths. And I just thought the timing of it, I, I had to nod back to it because it would never have begun if it wasn't for Pete on Twitter saying, can I come and join one of your book club sessions? And now this is our 62nd 
um, session that will be shared. Um, we've done a couple now with Atoll, which is brilliant to, to be able to bring that angle into it as well and, and, and keep things moving and be introduced to new people also. So thank you ever so much, everybody, for this evening. And I just think looking through the pie charts chapter, I know that's the one we're focusing on. I know a few people were grateful to have a focus and not to have to do the whole thing because it is it is hugely detailed and it's absolutely brilliant that it is. And I will hand over to Dave because Dave's going to include the why behind why we included this, which which goes without saying. How could we not? It's Pete's next book. And also, I am frustrated reading this because I'm like, I wish it had been laid out in this way for me 10 years ago, 15 years, five years ago, because I'm reading it through and I'm like, that makes so much sense. That's a really good example. That explanation there's brilliant. As in, it's just such a nice, friendly read as well. It's not intimidating. I'm not having to really wade through lots of really complicated ways of saying something. It's something I can lift up and go, how am I gonna look at pie charts? Ah, oh, I can do it that way rather than the way I was taught it or the way I'm trying to make it work. So yes, I am quite new to all of this visible maths side of it. Um, and, and I'm just hugely grateful and I cannot wait to hear everybody else's discussions. So there you go. Thank you so much, all of you who said yes to coming and joining us this, after, this evening. Um, and Dave, over to you for your bit now. Thank you very much, Rhi, and, and thanks, Pete, again, for, for taking the time to join us um, tonight. And as well, thanks for hosting this um, this chat, because um, we get so much out of them um, every single time, um, thinking about how we're going to um, take what we read and, and put it into the classroom. So that's what we're all about. And, um, and Pete, what a brilliant second album it is, as, as we're talking about that, uh, that second book. It's it just really um, encapsulates everything that I want to know as a maths teacher uh, when I go into my classroom, how I'm going to um, communicate um, the ideas, the concepts, and um, in, in the most efficient way that's going to help those students to really understand what's going on. So not, not just this process, but um, which I, I sometimes succumb to um, teach them a process and this is how you do it, but really understanding why things are, are working and happening in the classroom. So. Um, I, I describe this book to, to people as one of those books that you want just sitting around in your maths office. And, and my, it's confession time, but I haven't read it um, cover to cover, page by page, um, because it is just so huge. It's like five, six hundred pages of absolute um, joy and, and, and just so many nuggets to take away. Um, but every time I'm working um, with maybe an ECT or, or maybe some more experienced member of staff that's come in to say, how would you best um then the first thing i do is hesitate i stutter and then i go let me go and get a book and then i have a little look through with them and then we find what it is we're trying to get to and and how best to, to explain it and we, we we will walk away each and every time going that makes so much more sense now and and that's what the book is for me it's just um it's sense making um with, with lots of the um lessons that i teach um and, and that we teach if we're not sure what to do we've got someone we can go and um, i know you alluded to it but it's almost like you can hear uh, Pete's voice through the book. It's like he's just warmly coaching you through how you're going to teach all of these um, topics. And, and to, to have that just by your side, um, it's that, that scaffold, it's that, that security blanket, it's that, um, that, that piece of, of knowledge that maybe you, you don't have or, or maybe you did have but you've forgotten, um, that you can just go back and remind yourself of why these particular techniques work. So, so much to talk about. Um, the reason why um, pie charts, Basically, um, when talking to, to other staff, it's, it's one of those topics which I think sometimes gets neglected a little bit. I've been working on my year 11s um, this year, and we've been talking about the topics that we're particularly strong at, and, um, and we do a lot of number work, and we do a lot of work um, with solving equations and uh, finding missing angles, but, but quite often it comes to topics like transformations, like pie charts, where uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's the, the, the sort of... Um, the, the logistics of, of teaching pie charts. Maybe it's my own confidence in how confidence in how I'm going to explain something. But but it's one of those where I feel like I have more gaps. And when I talk to other maths teachers, it's one of those topics where I think that a conversation around sort of the best approaches I think would be really supportive. So that's why I thought that'd be a good place to start or to talk at some point. But of course, the, the conversation will go where it goes. And, and Pete, I know you talked last beforehand about are there any particular questions? Well, well, I guess there's one repetitive question is, um, so how would you do that, Pete? Or, or what would your ideas be? And, and that's, that's what we're here for, is to talk about our ideas, how it goes into practice, and then 
And then what, what do you do? What are your thoughts? And, and there's just so much here to talk about. So Pete, thank you for writing it. Thanks for talking with us. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to, to get going. So I didn't know if there's, um, you wanted to sort of introduce your thoughts behind um, sort of where the book started from, building on your last book and, and, and through. But Pete, thank you so much. I'll hand over to you. Yeah, no worries, no worries. You're both far, far, far too kind. But uh, yes, thank you. No, I mean, it was like you said, Dave, you know, over the last, what, 17, 18, coming up two years, there's an awful lot of stuff that just didn't make sense for so long of it. And I've been in the very privileged position where I've been able to, you know, talk regularly with some people that are far wiser than me. Uh, you know, we, we were talking before the show started about Anne Watson, um, obviously Mark McCourt, uh, Pete Griffin over at the NCTM, or used to be over at the NCTM as well. Uh, you know, and I've been lucky enough to, to have these sorts of experiences. Um, and quite similar to vis visible maths, really, in that, it just felt like this needed to be all in one place. It needed to, you know, I mean, Don Stewart is mentioned hundreds of times in that book as, as someone that you draw a lot of experience on. It just seemed like this needed to be all in one place where, like you say, people, I mean, I, I don't like, you know, it's 600 odd pages long. Uh, I don't think anybody would read it all cover to cover. And I don't think that would potentially be the best way to approach it, to be honest. Um, but it's that it's there as that sort of guide to say, you know, let's look at this bit and see where it goes. But I, I think the the one thing I will add to that is the one of the strongest things, and it's something that you know in the last few years I've come to I've come really to brought to the fore for myself in my practice is about that idea of coherence, uh, and I've been writing about it again recently. Um, and I'm doing a session with ATM in March uh, that's going to focus heavily on it as well. Um, but out of all of the subjects that kids study, maths is the one that should make most sense. Absolutely. By its very nature, the subject has to make sense. It has to follow logically. You know, any of other field that humans get involved in, there's opinions left and right and sent and all, but but maths follows it has to follow and for so so long i know in my own maths experience uh you know at school uh, which wasn't bad you know i did quite well out of it of course i did um but i know for many many people and i know for many students and and adults out there it, it never did make sense you know it was just a just a bunch of things they had to try and learn and remember and remember when to do and then got wrong and got new yeah, yeah, yeah. and so i think one of the big things from that i wanted to achieve with this is to show how actually you know this can make sense and if we approach it right with kids and you know, with learners it, it it can make sense but one of the ways it makes sense is to draw attention to those ever weaving threads that run through the whole of school level maths. And that's why it had to be the size it was, because it does literally track or tries to track and allow the reader to track those threads all the way through from, you know, acquisition of early number, which I know very little about. Lisa knows a lot more about than I do. Um, but, you know, there are there's some bits in there and I've read some stuff around that right through to, you know, like you were mentioning, transformations, vectors, uh, you know, and just trying at each stage to, to show what ties those things together, to track so that we make sure the students way. understand those things about those ideas. You know, that's the tagline, teaching about mathematics, not just how to do. Um, and if students understand these things about those mathematical ideas, then actually the the whole subject can make more sense to more people uh you know and i think that that's got to be where we go as a, as a subject and how we improve you know i've always said that the fact that only one in five students reach 16 and can only not well can't even get halfway through a higher tier gcse maths paper is, is shambolic and you know, I hold my hands up and say I'm no better than at this point, at this point. 
but I'm trying to be, and I think this is one of the ways that we do get there. But it needs, you know, I mean, no one person is responsible for a student's learning journey. I pick them up, even if I pick them up in year seven, I'm only responsible for half of it at best. And that's assuming I take them all the way through. In reality, I'm responsible for maybe a year or two of it. And it's, it needs that coherence of ideas through the subject, but it needs teachers to be coherent with the way they're working so that we can all follow on from each other. And I think if this book allows more teachers to, to sort of do that and to think about that, you know, where has this come from? Where is it going? How can I set it up so that it's, that students have got chance to make sense of this idea in a way that is actually going to be germane to how they might will make sense of related ideas or different stimulus where they encounter the same idea and we're going to talk about that in pie charts as well i think then that's what it's for and if it helps do that then great and if it doesn't help that well then you know i wrote 600 pages for very little but never mind That's, sorry, Rhi, I'm uh, interrupting you, but that, no, Pete, that's, um, that's a brilliant sort of just introduction to, to where we're, we're going to go on. And um, just looking through um, the, the chapter on pie charts, that really stand out um, to me. It's just, it made me think of like the ratio tables work. It made me think about um, when when I'm drawing a pie chart, um, I'm imagining plan out lesson. I'm thinking, thinking about how am I going to get them to draw it? How am I going to do um, do the sort of um, construction side of things, but it just took, took me straight into thinking about ratio tables. What what method am I going to use? Um, and and the way is sort of almost this conversational feel that people can use a unitary approach to finding the angles required to the pie charts working, um, but they can also use the exchange rates. Talking about how um, sort of the different methods might work, thinking about the pros and cons, but just getting me to think about sort of what I'm going to do to start that um, that process and. Um, and I think that's just an incredibly important um, thing to be to be considering. So I didn't know if there's anything in particular on that chapter, Pete, that you think as a starting point uh, we should be considering, or whether we should be um, sort of there's, there's things to avoid, there's things misconceptions that we need to really bring to the front of our minds, or or, or any thoughts as you write in that chapter that's going to help somebody get started who's less confident on teaching this topic. Well, I mean, the first thing I'll say is is it's not a chapter; it's part of a larger chapter on charting and graphing. And I think when you consider pie charts that, that you know you consider you have to consider it in the wider realm of graphing but i don't think we should start there i think we'll, we might get to that um and you know like people like craig barton as, as, and chris bolton are so uh, eager to point out and i you know i do have i do go with them on this in part there's a few different bits that they've got to be a, that kids have got to be able to do in terms of you know and i write about this drawing the angles and you might do that separately you know you need to practice that skill completely separately to anything to do with calculation of angles or things like that but fundamentally pie charts are a proportional representation they are a representation of how different parts relate to a whole they're proportional ratio representations and kids should know that kids should understand that uh and you know kids should see that that forms part of that larger mathematical idea and of course one of the ways that you do that is through consistent use of representation that's what one of the ways that you're that you can draw that out for kids and make that explicit to them you know and there's a there's a bit in there where i do a comparison with an earlier example from a different chapter and it's exactly the same example that i used i think it was chapter six around proportionality and things like that and show well you know actually no difference no difference at all same mathematical idea same mathematical structure let's make that bit let's teach kids about that make that the, the explicit bit so i guess that's you know uh, that's a potential place to start um i think there are other things as well you know that are in there and that are common for graphing in terms of when are these things useful when are they not uh, different ways that we could be presenting information to pupils to get them working with these things in lots of different ways because you know my experience of pie charts in the past was, was relatively boring and straightforward in terms of uh you've got this many people or this many things equating to this uh you know draw a pie chart interpret the pie chart would be uh if if you've got this many people how many people chose this or how many people chose that and there are some just lovely things you can do about 
and with pie charts that are not just teaching them to answer those sorts of questions or solve those sorts of problems. So I don't know if this is an opportunity to sort of bring others into the conversation because we've monopolized it for a little bit uh, and, and sort of get their thoughts and feelings about that. But I think that's possibly where we start. Yeah. So I'm to, sorry. Well, sorry, Ethel, you go. I know, you go, Abby. Yeah, go for it. I was going to say, to add what you were saying in terms of the ratio tables, I think that's consistent across the chapters that I've read so far. It's not just conceptual threads that you've laid out for people. It's like the models and metaphors that you've used too. So it's not just ratio tables for a specific part of progression proportion. Anywhere it's applicable, you can see that you've nodded to it to make that highlight. And with other models and representations too, so like with the cues in air and the Dean's box, you can see it's all there, which I think is lovely to emphasise to the teachers. That's another like cohesive device to make it really stick for the students to see that they are connected. Me, I think the biggest, the biggest thing I took from it was that that whole that whole that kind of the purpose that a pie chart is a relationship to a whole mm -hmm. because actually if they don't understand that bit of it their understanding of pie charts is, is ultimately flawed and that's the key bit that we've got to get across at the beginning of teaching pie charts is that that relationship to the whole because otherwise they will have misconceptions about when they can use them and when they can't and, and what those numbers represent and I think that's going to that's really key in terms of kind of developing the teaching of this. Yeah, the Pokemon example is a nice one in terms of, well, would this actually make sense to use it here? Does it show us anything? I don't actually use that word in the book because I didn't want to get into trouble for copyrights. And I actually, when when we did this, when, when Rhi and Dave said they were going to focus on this, I thought to myself and I thought, actually, I used the names of them in there. I probably should have changed the names as well. I should, probably should have called it like, Chirizord and Blostoise and you know Vonosaur or something like that because I mean hopefully it won't get well I mean I shouldn't say that but it probably won't get big enough that I'll get into trouble with the people in Japan but I did I did consider that and yeah I didn't use the the actual name of the TV show for that very reason. I think it's really interesting they're talking about ratio tables and, and the kind of one of the things that stuck out for me was that proportion to the whole because I think certainly in primary, um, for anyone who's a secondary colleague who's not necessarily familiar with where pie charts sit in primary, they're introduced in year six. Um, so they're introduced in year six as part of the national curriculum and they're often introduced in a very procedural way, unfortunately, um, in the sense that they we tend to just interpret them. Um, and so it was really interesting to me to think about how actually, I, I'm not sure even I make enough emphasis on the, the relationship to a whole. And I really liked your not Pokemon example, um, because it, it made me feel that, uh, it made me think about, well, do we ever show our children non-examples? And do we ever really emphasize that? Or do we just show them, here's a survey with birds and here's a survey with cups? And, and do we ever kind of really help them to understand what that whole is and what that proportionality is. So it's really refreshing for me to read that and to think about how they're introduced in primary, um, especially thinking about how you go on to use them later on in secondary. Yeah, and just to echo the whole proportionality aspect of it, um, uh, it it's linked to actually it's funnily enough you link in the fractions chapter you say like introducing fractions using circle is a terrible idea because you, you, that's a basically a closed representation isn't it so it's like um it's like the whole part whole thing um you know in a multiplicative sense uh is it's like one of the main threads in secondary maths uh, i was at a primary maths conf earlier this week and in primary we we're you know focusing on mostly in the early time uh, as the additive and subtractive uh and then towards secondary, you kind of build that up to this kind of proportionality and multiplicative reasoning, which is ratios, fractions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah. So it's just yeah, the the book kind of neatly goes through uh, these various strands and ties them up very nicely. Yeah. And that's actually, I mean, that's one of the hardest jumps for people to make, you know. And and people again more intelligent than me have, have written huge amounts about this, you know, government projects, ICAMs, things like that. That that step from additive to multiplicative reasoning is really, really challenging for a lot of learners. And, you know, finding 
places to do that and showing students that actually in these places actually the same thing you know i was just looking again at, at sort of some of the examples that um that i give for different ways that you could get kids working in a in a multiplicative way with pie charts uh you know uh the frequency of each rating uh, the angle used for the frequency of five stars is 210 how many of the 120 people 56 people represented by an angle of 210 56 people uh represented by an angle of 210 but the four star was 120 how many people said that but actually i'm, I'm then considering all of the different ways that i've laid out in the chapter six around ratio and actually you could pull any of those sorts of approaches any of those question types into by you know in the right in chapter six it, it talk you know it, it's there are things like if these two sections are this then what's this section and you know if the difference between these two sections and actually you can bring any of that into pie chart and show kids actually exactly the same question types exactly the same question structures just different context different numbers because ultimately it's the same mathematical idea i i agree and it, it is it's the same of course i agree i get it's the same mathematical idea but i see that when somebody else points it out to me because as much as you know how i learned maths i couldn't have done it too badly because you know i'm still loving the subject with what i do today but i also still have a lot of baggage from that in the sense that that was my experience of it so it isn't with some things it isn't until somebody lays it out in in, in such a clear way as you have done that i'm like oh it does link to this oh i hadn't realized that because for some things i still have them in these separate filing cabinet drawers you know that they're, they're not interlinked in the same way i don't have it in a coherent structure uh, or, or, or or pathway myself yet I'm, I'm still developing that and i'm more than happy to to say that that's the position i'm in so i'm hugely grateful to others that have taken the time and woven these strands together to help to support the rest of us because it or people like me because it's just hugely helpful and using a language that doesn't make me feel daft for not knowing it um because i also think that with this i'm i am so used to having talked for 20 years i'm so used to this is how i've done it and i for, it's all too easy to forget what the whole journey likes to be needs to be for novices that i've done it this way this is how i'm going to do pie charts today and then this is how i'm going to do something else tomorrow whereas actually what you've shown here and i know it's, it's throughout the book and we, we we, we're linking back to that all the time to keep the session coherent is you're just dripping in every now and then and dotting in all of the other links that there are like if i if i go back to the um teacher tap poll the other day about what aspects of maths would teachers more like to drop or would people like to drop from their subject a number of people might have put loci in constructions. And then I saw that on your tweets, you were drawing out a few of these and actually saying, well, well no, this, this has a place. This is really important. And actually, it does, because you, you mention in pie charts that actually going back to those skills that they need in loci and constructions with being able to draw that pie chart and remembering that that's part of constructions at the same time, being able to do an angle, not just from a, a horizontal line that they score, uh, that they need to do an angle from, but an angle from another angle within a pie chart as well. And so many assumptions are made, even when I think I have more of an idea of what it is like for a novice. I'm still not as co I'm not as coherent as a number of other people are out there. So those were the other things that I wanted to develop on uh, or, or bring to the table for this as well, because without somebody pointing it out, I'm not going to pick it up myself because it's it's complicated. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, going back to right to the start. Uh, it was something, actually, I think it was a session I was doing not long after Visible Maths, but I was talking about how the representations, uh, because again, you know, they, they, they help with that coherence, as we've discussed. Uh, and I, it may have even been in an ATM session, again, that I was doing at the time. And somebody at the end asked me, you know, well, this is all great, but where do you get the time to actually sit down and do this thinking? that you know that i'd done with visible maths and that you know because although you know all of that stuff was out there um 
there are things I remember that, you know, there are things that I'd sort of independently rediscovered almost. I hadn't read. I remember in absolute excitement running into another one of my teachers in my department's classroom when I figured out how you could use double-sided counters to model uh, subtraction of a negative number. And then I, when I started looking into writing the book, it was probably a couple of years later, uh, maybe three or four years later, uh, I realised, oh, no, actually, that was a thing. And actually, if I'd just read a bit more, had time to read a bit more, I would have seen that other people had done that. Um, but, the you know, the, the, the sort of comment stuck with me around, well, when do you get this time to do this, to do this thinking and to pull all this together? And I guess I've just been lucky enough. I was the, I was the one lucky enough that, you know, I, I found the time and, and I made the time and, uh, you know, pulled it all together. Not so I could do people's thinking for them, because that's never a good idea, but that I could prompt people, hopefully, to think in the right places and think about, the, the, you know, some things that are probably important to think about. Uh, and so, you know, if it helps with that and, and helps teachers to to sort of have a reference to to sort of prompt their thinking and start their thinking um then great i think that's really powerful because as i know as a head of department um, and when i was a head of department having that department meeting time rather than it being admin focused using that time to really delve into how you teach something and this book is going to be fantastic for that just taking little snippets and creating that discussion because you can do I say two or three pages which is just a section and really use your department meeting time to look in depth and talk about it and look at examples and you know those misconceptions and, and how you can tackle that that kind of conceptual teaching of it just to really kind of build that in and it's going to be so powerful for heads of department and for and for t teachers to have that rich conversation and as a starting point to kind of lead into that it's going to be going to be great for kind of all those people um who do that absolutely because it scaffolds that conversation and and gets it going and it also means it depersonalizes the conversation from people sharing what they're doing at the moment they're looking at something external something somebody has has put together that really well informed and they're discussing that and our teaching is very personal to what we do so when we're talking about different approaches and it's, it's hard not to get defensive I, you know because that's that's what you do and you worry that somebody's putting a value judgment on it so using an external source as that prompt without having to do all of the research to be able to pull something together and know that you can keep dipping back into that same one and in, in a really gentle way links it all together for you um that's a, that's an absolute cracking idea Carleen and and when I saw it, I was like thinking in my head I'd link this page to a scheme of work and this page so if somebody wanted to know more as you said Pete it doesn't give them all the answers but it prompts their thinking and so instead of being it's it helps in the short term but also more powerfully helps to develop us as 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 teachers in the longer term at the same time for our for our own connectivity sorry Dave I'll be quiet now you want to talk oh no I'm going to come in first Dave sorry uh, <laughs> just to say get what you're saying Ree teachers absolutely should share their own practice and share 100% what they are doing in the classroom uh you know and and when we can we you know we should absolutely be able to do that uh, you know, freely and without judgment, even though it is that very personal thing, uh, you know, always been committed to the idea that that as a profession, we do that. Uh, but I do get what you're saying. For some people, that is, you know, particularly in the accountability, let's not get into the political bits, Pete, but in the accountability culture that many of us have come up in. Um, yeah, it's I think it's always the easiest thing to do. Once you've harnessed that safe space within your team, it's fine. It's getting that started. Yeah. And then people will more openly share, share their ideas and their approaches because they know it's non-judgmental and it's developmental. But the first time you do it, you just have to show them that it's okay. So no, we it's it's we're getting there, aren't we? And we're just delaying you coming in, Dave. Sorry. Oh, that's brilliant. Um and and for me, it's just um it just made me think a little bit about some of the links that, that you you are making between these topics and um and beforehand um i'd be teaching these lessons quite isolated as, as we talked before um and that's the experience that's becoming more expert at it um and maybe not having either the time or the expertise to be able to spot those links um independently having this here just 
really, really helps um, this book to, to be able to see where those those topics link together. Um, as I talked about with the pie charts, um, I see the ratio table straight away. Um, but there's other little links um, which have been talked about since where I'm thinking, oh yeah, now I get how these topics are, are, are linking now. And I can start to think more about the multiplicative reasoning in other topics too. And I can start to um, almost teach that sort of same concept, but uh, with a different vehicle, you described it as pie charts as a place to do this. and. Um, and it's just made it a lot less daunting to, to go in and teach this isolated topic where um, I feel a little bit less confident. Um, I now feel like I'm teaching multiplicative reasoning again. Um, I'm teaching some low kind construction again, but I'm teaching it with this new vehicle, which is just going to make it more interesting for my students. And all of a sudden, it's flipped it on its head how I see that pipe chat lesson. I'm much more confident in the delivery. Uh, and that's why this book for me is just so important. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, actually, Dave. And Mark uh, McCourt, who I mentioned earlier, uh, spoke some or said something around this in terms of um, you know one of the one of the aspects from NCTM and other places from you know uh, the Far East where a lot of the really good ideas have come from recently um, is around variation and they talk about variation in terms of procedural variation and then conceptual variation and one of the points that Marx made is that actually that word that name conceptual variation is probably not the best name for it because actually the concept doesn't vary what vary and he 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 sort of suggested the idea of perceptual variation because what varies is our perception of the concept you know the lens through which we see it the 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 example set the the different concepts that are coming together in this case like you say constructions with proportional reasoning uh, but but the concept itself is the concept. You know, the, the idea is the idea at the end of the day. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a point I make a lot with, when I talk. I know we're not talking about pie charts now, but it's a point to make a lot when I talk about things like uh, addition of fractions as an example. And it's probably an example that many of you heard before because I've been in rooms where I've had conversations like this with most of you. Uh, but things like, you know, kids find really, really tricky stuff like adding two fractions together because they, you know, they add the numerators, add denominators, but the reason they do that, big reason they do that, is because they don't have a well-developed concept of either fraction or addition. And actually, if you if you support them to develop a well co well-developed concept of both fraction and addition, then actually the addition of fractions isn't surprising at all. It has to be like that. Which again brings me back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of math. Ha math has to follow logically the idea of addition hasn't changed at all it's just now being applied to these things called fractions instead but if my idea of addition is not well formed because i haven't been exposed to these different ways of thinking about addition these different models and metaphors as amy mentioned earlier well then that is where i'm going to have difficulty and you know visible mass did that a little bit more than conceptual mass but still plenty in there around conceptual mass about what should those models and metaphors actually look like so that kids get the complete experience of this but it ties in with you know get the complete experience of this concept and when do they need it what do they need it for uh that's probably where conceptual maths is is trying trying to do that work is is sort of they need to have this concept here because otherwise when they come to this or they need to have this art, this part of the concept here, because by the time they come to this, it's there. But the concept itself, like you said, Dave, doesn't change. It, it's multiplicative reasoning and it, it's construction. And, you know, those things are what they are and forever will be. Oh, thank you. Lisa, come and join us. Um, so I suppose I'm not sure I have an answer and I'm not even sure this is a question, but I'm just thinking about, we all we've talked about so far about how this kind of idea of coherence and how, you know, Dave was saying, actually, it's made him kind of really rethink about how how pie charts are linked to this and linked to this and how there's a lot of proportionality and it's kind of linked to the multiplicative reasoning and stuff. So I wondered whether the book is actually kind of suggesting in some way that the way in which we perhaps teach needs to also be turned on its head a little bit in the sense that we, I, I don't know, Pete, and I'm sorry if I'm kind of twisting what you've written, but whether it is more about actually recognising perhaps there isn't a place to have like a unit or a segment of lessons that are just on pie charts. And in fact, we need to think about whether we bring that representation of proportionality into earlier or later units or segments where we look at proportionality and look at those different things or whether actually 
it needs a break and then you introduce pie charts. I'm, I'm not sure, but I just feel like it's, it's suggesting that actually I'm starting to think about where I'm placing pie charts in a primary curriculum and where that would fit. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think a unit of work is probably still quite a valid vehicle for for teachers in terms of you know focusing their attention on certain aspects of mathematics um you know pie charts you know typically sits in a, a unit around data and uh, you know perhaps even you know refining down as far as categorical data uh, and i don't think i think we'd be asking a lot to sort of replace that and that might we might be getting to a, a, a bit where we would throw the baby out of the bathwater if out, out with the bathwater if we suddenly said no we're gonna have to tear up all the unit structure we can't have units anymore and things like that but i think what is important is when teachers are thinking about those units is recognizing where things come from pre to that and where they go and you know the point i'm making there is is that's an incredibly difficult thing it's a really really tr tricky thing to to sort of do um you know and i mentioned in there that the actual probable diagram of of how these things are all linked together may well be greater than three-dimensional uh, i know lasalle have done some great work in sort of tying it all off with nodes and things like that in a three-dimensional diagram um but yeah it it's even then, I'm not sure that captures, you know, because technically with that, you could potentially start anywhere and move around the place. Um, but, uh, you know, multiplication is in general as an example. There are aspects of multiplication that rely on addition, but you don't even, for me, get a full, you can't achieve a full sense of the concept of number until you know something about multiplication so you're taking parts of the concept and little bits from of models to sort of build it up and build it up and build it up uh, and i think it's just about teachers being aware of those bits that need to be brought into that unit um you know so like say we're, we're talking about pie charts i don't think there's any wrong anything wrong with uh having that in a in a data representation unit because, you know, although we've talked a lot about proportionality, because it's where we just, you know, as I said at the beginning, there's an awful lot in there as well about graphicacy. And, and, you know, what do we mean? What do we use graphs for? Why are they there? What is their purpose? What do we teach kids about graphs? Not just to draw lots of different graphs or interpret lots of different graphs, but what do we want to teach kids about graphs? Um, and about what they do and why they're there and what they can tell us and things like that. So I don't see a problem with, with pie charts sitting within a unit like that, say. Uh, equally, I don't see them as a there being a problem with them sitting in a unit about proportionality um, that explores the concepts of proportionality and shows that they're there. But I think whichever way around you do that, and teachers will make those decisions for themselves, departments will make the decisions, for, whichever way you do that, you can't neglect the other bit. So if you're going to put it in a unit about proportionality, you still need to have that conversation about graphing. And if you're going to put it in a unit about graphing, you still got to have that conversation about proportionality, you know, and, and say, find ways to do that. And one of the thing, def, definite things I didn't do uh, in this was try to mandate pedagogy because I don't think anybody should be doing that. You know, everybody's got different contexts, different groups of pupils they're working with. And, you know, it's very explicit about this, that whether you, you know, try to get kids towards this understanding through offering lines of inquiry and prompts that kids can follow, or whether you do that by very explicitly pointing these things out and making these things and getting students to, you know, try and explicitly see that is ultimately for you to decide in your context. But I think it's really, really important that you do have to make sure that kids reach that you know and get that full view uh, so as a long answer to uh, your question lisa uh I, I don't think we need to necessarily do away with the unitary structure i think there are potentially some units that we you know some standard units that that maybe bear revision in terms of what ideas fit well with what and maybe the book has something to say about that but i think what it really is there to say is 
wherever wherever you teach this and whatever you teach this provided these ideas have been explored before and that's what you know the prerequisites at the start of every chapter and section are about provided these ideas have been explored before then there's a conversation to be had here about this and you know even where things can be sort of switched around i think one of the things i talked about in there was standard form coming before or after the idea of significant figures you know as an example you know and i don't think there's a right answer to that i know you can you can explore standard form and then explore significant figures later uh, you can explore significant figures and then explore standard form later but absolutely at some point what you need to do is bring those two together and make the link between the two and say you know and actually the reason these figures are significant is because and again, whether you lead kids to that or tell kids that, the reason these significant these figures are significant is because one is ultimately our general choice of counting unit, but it is not the only counting unit. And in standard form, what we do is we count with the highest possible place value that we have, and we treat that as our counting unit, which is why the decimal point moves over here because the decimal point's job is not to separate the ones from the part ones, it's to separate the units from the part units. And that's why I get into fun conversations with people like Charlotte, who I don't know is out there, and Johnny, who I don't know is out there, about whether we call it ones or units. And it is definitely ones, people. It is definitely ones because one is not the only unit. Yeah, we can choose whatever we like as our counting unit. And whenever we choose that counting unit, the decimal point separates the whole unit from the part units. But when we're counting in ones, we're counting in ones. But, you know, when we choose to count, go back to the thing, when we choose to count in other counting units, like we count in millions or thousands or things like that, then how many digits do we need to represent the number? Those are the significant digits and for any accuracy. And unless kids see that together, no matter which one you do first, potentially, but kids have got to see that together at some point. So whichever one you explore later has to be tied. Absolutely has to be tied. If not, you've not taught them the, map, the 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 entire mass of that situation that's a very long answer to your question lisa but i hope i hope it does go some way to answering it no i really appreciate that thank you it's been fascinating listening to to your point of view so i really appreciate it you don't need me to bring you in dave oh i do i got a bit of a lag on here i know i'm gonna accidentally interrupt um someone um, so <laughs> halfway through um, that, that amazing um, answer, Peter, and then I just cut in or something. But, um, but yeah, the, um, the, I just want to say, and, and you said it anyway, so I probably could have put my hand down, to be honest, but um, the really important part of the book now for me is the prerequisites and the link concepts. Because every time I'm going to be teaching PyTarts or one of these, um, sort of the next units um, that, that comes up in the scheme of uh, learning for us, I'm going to be looking at the prerequisites and I'm going to be making sure that I'm... Um, making those links and uh, because as I was talking about the bar charts before um, if if you are um, sort of new to, to exploring where where all this is linked together and you've you've been taught um, in of these topics in, in sort of isolated um, lessons and making those links is a little bit more challenging and having that as a reference point just to go okay I can see what what topics this is going to link to I can see the link concepts here are going to be in your pictograms your bar charts your vertical line charts I can see the prerequisites of proportion um, and, and number and angle here. And, and so I'm going to be bringing what we've done in those topics into, into the, um, the modeling, the teaching that I'm doing, the practice that we go through, the, uh, the, the conversations that we have. Then, then I, think, um, I think that's uh, definitely a small but very important part of your book um, to help people to do that. I totally agree, Dave. Um, and what's really interesting is how many people probably don't necessarily think about where pie charts fits in that picture, or actually how many people know where pie charts goes after this. Um, it, whilst it's not a GCSE maths, when you go into GCSE statistics, for example, pie charts goes where there's a change in radius and it's related, and, it, and the area of the pie chart is linked um, to the to the total frequency and that kind of understanding of that's why it's really important that we teach them about that and kind of, you know, whilst teachers don't need to go into the depth of it, if that's not what, if they're not teaching that subject, understanding where it goes next, 
um, so that they can make that really kind of explicit and linking it to, you know, pie charts is such a useful thing in the real world because when they, you know, if they've ever got to write a report or, you know, they in, even in other subjects, they've really got to understand that concept to be able to explain what it is that they're showing. So it's really important that kind of linking of things um, that, that go with it. Yeah. I think that's why it's important as well to look at when it's misleading, like you've done a few times within that chapter, because it's used so often and they see it time and time again, but then it's used to sometimes manipulate um, people and they need to be aware of it, that they need to be aware of when bars, bar charts can be misleading, when pie charts can be misleading. So I think it's, that's an important part as well within the chapter that teachers can use. Absolutely, especially when you've got statistical tools that you can say, okay, draw a pie chart. I like the look of the pie chart. That 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 looks like it's saying what I need it to without actually thinking about the data and whether it's the right representation for that data. And I think if I go back to um, what Lisa was saying and then what you were saying, Pete, and it, it about the units of work and, and where different things stand and it reminded me of the um, mass chat live we had about statistics and we were talking about maybe different aspects of statistics being placed in different places in our units of work rather than in one lump it doesn't mean we don't also visit it as a unit of work but then also looking at where it links up in other areas of mathematics as well and looking at other opportunities and it might actually be that something is better placed in um, you know capture recapture where is that b best placed in the curriculum for the students to be able to pick up on it in a really gentle way that naturally leads on from what they're doing without us just trying to box things up too much and I think the the discussion there around yeah it's important to have these things together but also to look at them when they are um really well placed where they link with other aspects of mathematics as well where they can build on enhance upon that because looking through your chapter has made me reflect and think well which examples have i given that actually haven't been useful when i've tried to contrive a context to make it make it more interesting or do i really know the ins and outs of pie charts like I like I thought I did because I'm only using it at surface level linking with what you were saying there Carleen of actually the next steps with GCSE statistics because I've I've taught A level very little statistics at A level I don't think pie charts comes into that but GCSE statistics is is seeing things and framing things in a very different way um, and, and and they were all just really valid points even even around this this very small section of this incredible tomb of a book um, on pie charts. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I did consider uh, referencing the the area of the circle being related to the to the frequency, the total frequency, because I, it was something I was aware of, and I didn't in the end because of the uh, you know I wanted to keep it school level maths and somebody else asked me you know why why why, why did, did you does it go as far as calculus and I was like no no, no. come on it, it's 163,000 words I, I, I'd break 200,000 if I needed to talk about all these things that are in GCSE statistics and in A-level maths as well and you know to be quite frank I haven't taught A-level maths now since about 2012 2013 so I don't know if I would have the the sort of knowledge necessary and it'd take me a while to build that back up but i mean even you know that aside 
Uh, and one of the things I was just re-referencing from from there from what I've written there, um, there are there's something that's used in you know, not just the mass curriculum, of course. There are representation that kids encounter all the while, and it was really telling to me because since I've been an assistant principal, one of the um, line man one of the departments I line manage is the DT department, and the DT department use pie charts. They come up in their exams, and they are persistently always in reference to percentage values. Every pie chart in any exam that they take in this DT that I've ever seen anyway, and that from what my head of DT tells me is that's what it's like, has the has the, uh, the sort of sectors, and then it has percentage labels attached to each one of them all the time. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, if we don't make that link from proportionality because the, with the best will in the world, the D teachers, DT teachers are brilliant, but they ain't making that link. You know, that that's not their job. They are going to teach that in a relatively instrumental way to borrow from Skemp. Uh, but if we don't make that link between proportions of the whole, ratios leading to percentage, and show kids in some way or other, however you want to do it, like I say, if you want to do it through lines of inquiry, if you want to do it explicitly, entirely up to you. But if we don't help kids see those links, then not only do you know pie charts look different to other examples of proportion, but pie charts don't even look the same in the maths class than they, as they do in in the geography classroom or in the DT classroom. And I mean that that that's how are kids supposed to cope with that? I can't imagine how kids would ever ever cope with that. And this is why so many kids ultimately don't cope with that and don't do well in one or both subjects. And you're right, I think they pay attention to the surface level structure of it. So if they see percentages in one subject, they think, oh, it's a completely different topic because in maths, that wasn't the case. So it's interesting knowing that. I didn't know it was predominantly like percentages focused. That's really interesting. I mean, that feels a little bit like welcome to primary teaching. And I think we're, we're starting to think about that as a trust. We're starting to think about actually, you know, particularly with graphs. So I think less pie charts in primary, but certainly things like bar and line graphs and other statistical representations. We're starting to think about how they're used in science or in geography or history, because actually the way our curriculum within the trust has been designed, I've written the maths curriculum, but I've done it without actually communicating with people who are at the science or the geography of the history. And actually we're finding the same thing as Pete's just mentioned, actually we're finding that line graphical representations look very different. And even though we as teachers teach those same subjects, we often approach them quite differently. And I don't think we necessarily make those connections. So I think that's quite interesting to think about how, how in secondary, how they are approaching that and whether I don't know how departments work particularly, but whether there's scope to make sure those communications happen because I suppose coherence has to happen across the subjects as well as just within the maths of art subjects. Yeah, that's definitely one of the trickier things to get right though, unfortunately, because, you know, that is very, very time intensive. Uh, not, you know, not just to sit down with your team and do this, sit about, down, you know, it's one of the ever pervading issues, isn't it? Of curriculum structure and things like that. Uh, but again, I just, just to reinforce my same message over and over again, because I am just a one-trip pony ultimately, and I have this message that I just keep giving over and over again. You know, you just mentioned bar charts and bar charts, bar models, representation of number. I mean, that's it is all it is. You know, it's a representation of the numbers with a scale so you can see them. It, it, ain't, it ain't nothing else. It's not special. It's just one of these. It just builds from before, and it, you, we just need kids to see. You know, I would hate to. And I, I, you know, going back a number of years earlier in my career, where bar charts were this thing, and it was this special representation that we used only ever with statistical data. No, 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 no. it's just actually, you know, a block that represents the number at the end of the day, uh, and a scale that represents it. And I think you know, the more that message goes to math teachers and then hopefully maybe widely i mean i can't see many science teachers or dt teachers or geography teachers reading this but uh they'll be put off by the cover for a start um but you know the more that message goes 
uh, the, I, it can only be a benefit as far as I can see. I can't see how it can be anything other than a benefit. Well, I think um, what you summed up there, Pete, is that that's, that's our experience, um, or many of us um, at school, is to learn them as, as separate things and these magical new topics that can only be used in particular um, scenarios. And, and so, so we're almost as teachers having to unlearn this and, and to have it sort of set out as you have really helps us to be able to do that because, um, because we need to unlearn it so that we can then uh, pass on that wisdom to, to our students so that they're going to be able to, to see that the right way the first time, that it is just a, another representation, a multiplicative reasoning or additional um, addition and subtraction and, and, and those basic skills that, uh, that, as you say, a one trick pony, but it's the, it's the same. If we can just do that one thing and do it in those lots of different, using those lots of different vehicles and we can teach it well, um, then our students are going to be so much better prepared then to, to be able to communicate those ideas to to the people that they teach and and uh and yeah i think the book really does set us up um for that um when you're talking about the the science lesson um, or the the dt lesson i thought of it as my my science lesson when i was um thinking of this, the, the statistical um work that we might do or the, the graphical work speed distance time uh questions that i might see in my science lessons growing up um it was I, I remember thinking oh that's the science way and that's the math way and they were different things um in my mind i was I was doing speed distance time in, in science and, and there was a method for that and then I go into my maths lesson and it was a different question and it's a different process and it was a different topic. It was called the same thing, coincidentally, but they were different things that I was learning and, and, and to be able to sort of link that all together um, in a way that um, makes sense that it's just that, that one or two really clear main concepts that we're going over again and again, just looking at it in different ways. Um, it certainly flipped um, my way of thinking uh, about about some of these topics for the, for the better. Yeah, I think you might be underselling it slightly with one or two, Dave, to be fair. I think there's a few more than that. I think Mark, as Mark suggested, 350 at all, you might remember the number. Is he, he, he talks about a very limited number of school level concepts that we have roughly 1600 hours to... 320 um, ideas, 1600 sorry? hours, 11 years or 13 years old. Yeah, how school, many, yeah. how many co different concepts? 320 odd. 320, I thought I knew it was 300 and something and I didn't count them, to be fair. <laughs> Uh, when I went through the book, I didn't I didn't count them and figure out how many there were. I know, you know, but again, I don't I, I use it in training terms because sometimes I talk about link concepts and are they two separate concepts that are linked together or is one building from the other? It it all gets a bit fuzzy and, and weird when you try and put it in and you know, say that right at the beginning that actually you can't really classify these things properly in that in that sort of way. Uh, you know, you've just gotta talk about the you know these ideas and, and where they link together and how they link together and how they develop from each other and how they how you can make sense of them but okay. let's just make it make sense i mean it's a it's a whole lifetime of learning really it's uh, for us um, you know it's like you understand addition then you understand multiplication and you understand multiplication of numbers negative numbers maybe you know later on and algebraic multiplication vectors matrices functions uh, then you go back and think oh multiplying two numbers adding two numbers it's kind of you know it, it, the, the more you understand at that level the more it uh, helps you understanding at the at the basic level and, and vice versa and you keep learning it's, it's a never-ending thing you know every time you have more clarity isn't that a beautiful thing eh, that we all continue to be learners even when we are teachers and even when we are leading the learning of others that we still continue to be learners and that we are open about that and you know we can be open and honest about that hopefully with pupils as well you know Dave, I've, I've, I needed to show you this about pie charts now because I've just read it in this book and I hadn't shown you it before and you need to hear about it now. And, you know, that, I, I, I'd love that. I think all classrooms should be like that. I mean, not necessarily all classrooms. I've all literally the time, done that. Because other, otherwise, you know, why would you... You can't do that every bloody time, I guess, because otherwise, otherwise it means you've always missed bits. But, but yeah, you know, classrooms that can be like that whenever they need to be, I think is the phrase probably. The biggest light bulb moment I had, it wasn't from the chapter that we're on about, um, but it was to do with um, enlargement when you spoke about, well, actually, the biggest misconception they have is referring to the centre of enlargement, they almost draw on it, or they just don't know what to do with it, they just completely ignore it. So you were talking about 
just looking at the vertices, like just looking at points and enlarging from the centre of long, just points. When I read that, I was like, oh my goodness, why haven't I done that before? It's like a light bulb moment that I was like, writing it down straight away, and like, definitely need to do this next time. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, all transformations to start with, how is a single point transformed? And that, but even in itself, with enlargements, that's caused these problems because foundation GCSE, they get told just, you know, enlarge a shape scale factor three. And it's like, well, if you if you only know about enlargement around a cent, from a centre, mm -hmm. how, do, how does that work? And then you, but that becomes an explicit thing you can explore, you know, actually means you can choose any, choose any centre you like. But mm -hmm. and again, um, Anne Watson talks about this a lot more intelligently than I do, but transformations are about space. They're not about just bits. So you, 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 what you want eventually is an understanding of how the space changes and how the space transforms. I mean, that's, that's literally where, it, what, you know, what we're talking about. So by starting to consider a point and then a collection of points, you get an insight into the space. And again, that's what kids should be learning about. Kids shouldn't be just learning to do this translation or this enlargement or this, uh, you know, this, this rotation or reflection. They should be learning about how, how space transforms and how we can, I mean, as I've done in the book, use vectors to, to sort of tie that all together. Um, because vectors turns out are a great way for describing spaces and what happens with them. Who knew? Um, and then, and then, yeah, you know, building that up. But it should definitely start with the point, hundred percent. So I'm glad you've you've gotten to that, Amy, and that that's going to promote promote the prompt some change there. Because yeah, that's definitely one of my things. And if we can all agree also that they should have a working understanding of at least the basis of vectors before we even start to explore that <coughs> CTM year seven, uh, then um, then yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate that as well because uh, yeah, I don't think you can re unless you know you've got some representation of, of how the the change going from this you know this center to that center or this line to this point. I, I think it makes it much more difficult to show how that transforms. We're getting away from the pie charts, but of course, that was that was fine. We said no, no, no. We said that at the beginning. The discussion goes where it goes. It, it's it does, absolutely yeah. Absolutely fine. Uh, and yeah, that. I mean, honestly, I mean, people have have, have heard me talk about this at MathsConf before with La Salle Ed, uh, and the use of vectors for transformations. I did a whole session on it, and it is one of my absolutely favourite things in that book. It is one of my absolutely favourite ideas because you know there are a lot in the past math teachers have been accused a lot of teaching lots of separate things and this just being a memory game at the end of the day you know the kids who get grade a's and, and now grade nines are the kids that that have more powerful memories and they can remember more things than other kids um and transformations was was i think one of the starkest examples of that you know to the point where you have to use the right word and remember the right word. You know, you get one mark in the exam for translation or reflection or rotation or enlargement. Um, and you've got to remember to do this. You've got to remember to do this. You've got to remember to do this. You've got, you know, if it's describing an enlargement, you've got to remember to say the word enlargement, to say the scale factor, to say the center. And when actually, you you know, if, if we can tie it all together through this lens of vectors for me uh, and talk about, well, if, if, enlarge right well what do we enlarge away from you know how does that make sense for the space to move what does that mean for the moving space uh yeah i i absolutely love that chapter it's one of my favorite chapters to write so well al i think is that i i think there were a small group of us maybe that would have laughed out loud um when watching despicable me and hearing Bector perkins describe who he was in his orange jumpsuit so that is that is still one of my favourite moments in a film. And see, you all know what I mean. Yeah, that yeah. my family that, still think I'm weird. So on on I'm that. Just, sorry, Ree. Sorry, I'm going yeah. to come in. That's embedded in my Prezi. And actually, yeah. I I have a Prezi that I use for vectors, and that is an embedded yeah. video in my Prezi. And every year I teach that, and I um, I actually do the dance and the voice. <laughs> I'm not going to do it on this chat. I, before anybody suggests otherwise, it would definitely go viral if you did. Categorically, <laughs> not happening. Uh, but you know, every year I do that, and uh, every year I get kids 
begging for a repeat performance of it. You know, I will get kids in class coming in and saying, do the vector dance, do the, ve do the vector dance, you know, talk the vet, and they, yeah, they absolutely love it. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Sorry, Reed, to interrupt you, but before you moved on, that needed saying. That's all right. I just needed a moment to compose myself over that that image. That's for the next maths conf, I think, Pete. You need to do a session on that one. Um, so it is, and I know uh, uh, this, these conversations are brilliant, and I know we can be talking for a really, really long time about this because it is an incredible book. And I just, it's one that I know is going to be very well thumbed by me for a very long period of time. and. Um, I suppose I'm going to kickstart the takeaways for this, really, to, 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 to round it off, if that's OK. I think one of the things I've, I've picked up from, from this evening and from everybody saying it, that it is OK to still be learning. It is OK to not be sure. It is OK, whatever stage you are, to, to pick up Pete's book, or, or a book like Pete's, of course, others others aren't available that are like this um but to pick up your book or something else and go i've never thought of it that way why didn't i think of it that way and it's not because of anything that we've done wrong it's just there's only so much we've got capacity for at any time and we're always improving and that excitement and that passion to to also look at where we can share that with our colleagues and and our students as well and so uh, for, for me my my takeaway is is literally that i'm just before i teach something the next time i'm actually going to take a look at pete's book the next time i'm going to teach them i'm going to go what what has he done what what has he said what what can i build on the next time i have a conversation with a colleague and and i'm working with somebody and we're talking about some subject knowledge aspect or something on a lesson or or a way they've explained it i think if this is one of those books that i'm actually going to go and dip into and and take a look at and and see what the examples are like there as well and it's it's genuine i wish it wasn't so heavy because it, it's it's going to be heavy to carry around in my bag but that's easy because every one of my schools just going to have to have a copy um get the kindle. that's what i was and, going to say buy loads of them and leave them everywhere yeah um, <laughs> because I, I get the kindle vision I, I like to write all over them though amy but uh, genuinely my takeaway is is i think for some things i'm gonna have to put myself back into a learning position again a novice position and and taking another look taking a, a fresh set of eyes on things when i'm doing it and and reinforcing the things that i'm like if pete said that it's okay but also then looking at other things and realizing how that they can be linked together in in a more coherent way and so thank you ever so much for taking the time and also listening to my very uncoherent takeaway just there so i i don't mind whoever else wants to go um i don't usually go first with the takeaways <laughs> I'll piggyback because mine was very similar and, and I'm going to steal Carleen's idea of using this within CPD because I think it's so thought provoking to if there's a unit coming up in the scheme of work, well actually let's all take a read of a sub chapter, what do we all think, what can we use as Carleen said, I think that's a brilliant idea. And yeah, get it on Kindle as well so I can take it to any school I'm at so I don't have to <laughs> get an extra big bag <laughs> to carry it around. Uh, my takeaway. Sorry, very... sorry, sorry. Lisa, I must admit, I, I brought two bags with me to the hotel and I have obviously brought my copy with me because I knew I was doing the bookshop, uh, the book chat. Uh, and I put it in the, my backpack, first of all, which is where I carry my laptop and things like that. Uh, and then I went to put my backpack on my back this morning and I was like, nope, that's going in the big bag. <laughs> that's going in the shoulder bag. That's not going in the backpack. I am not lugging that around on my back like that. So yeah, it, get the Kindle version. That's fine. I'm okay carrying it around on, on the tube actually. I just, like people look at me. <laughs> could start a conversation, some people actually, so. It's, it's huge. I, I said my, my takeaway my takeaway is get it delivered directly to your school, not even to your house, so that you can just have it at your school. Um, no, my my serious takeaway is it's much more specific. Although I, I I think it's really refreshing for me as someone who often feels much more novice, particularly when working with secondary experts, 
um, it's refreshing to hear people saying, like talking about putting themselves in the position of novices or less. So that's really refreshing. But my key takeaway is really specific. Um, so I'm going to make sure that any work that I've done on our curriculum around pie charts really makes reference to the whole and really focuses on that and also think about ways that I can transfer that information and that understanding to our teachers across the trust so that they they can make sure that they are really emphasizing that as well because that's one of the things throughout that whole segment on pie charts that really stood out to me. My takeaway is actually to speak to my ECT mentors um, across my schools and get them to kind of um, and maybe actually gift them a copy um, from within their own budget um, <laughs> but give them a copy to actually have those conversations when they're talking about how to teach because actually the mentors and the ECT having that conversation together I think was it could be really powerful and I think just um, well first of all Pete just say a massive thank you for, for everything you've done um, for us again today and, and the thinking that you've um, you, you've helped us to, to engage in because there's so much, um, as always, to, to take away. Um, you know, first of all, when the, I, I, I do un understand, um, so one or two concepts, maybe a few more, but you know that I'm not a very good at I call it a whole chapter as well. So uh, so I will practice the estimation part as my takeaway. Um, but in all seriousness, um, thinking about have I taught this concept um, somewhere before um, to think about the teaching uh, I, I always think with the end goal in mind but do I go as far as to think about the concept that I want to get across to them first uh, when I'm thinking about how I'm going to teach so bringing that concept to the very beginning of my planning um, is going to be my takeaway um, and, uh, and just like for example with the transformations we're talking about space and how that space transforms I don't think I've ever thought of teaching transformation with that being my first thought um, it sort of comes near the end and it shouldn't do and, and I want to bring the concept to the beginning of my planning that's my takeaway yeah that's a really nice one Dave actually and for anybody that's listening and watching out there that doesn't mean that's where you start with the kids you know and Dave's been clear with that it's it's that's where I start with my planning that's not where you start with the kids you know you start with the kids in a way that you can build up to that but knowing that that's what you want them to learn about and you know for my takeaway it's not a takeaway for me because i wrote the book to be fair um although there are you know there are things i can take away from from the conversation uh particularly around uh you know some of the uses say having those conversations with different people and, and prompting and things like that but my takeaway is a takeaway for anybody that's watching and reading uh watching or listening uh, either now or after which is consider always always what you want your kids to know about if where you start with teaching mathematics is what do i need to get the kids to be able to do then you're too late you're too late on what do they need to know about so that they can do go for it like that and you know I, I believe we need to try it at scale to see if it's there. You know, my school, this is the way we approach maths, but we started that just before the pandemic and the pandemic has obviously hurt us in a lot of different ways. Uh, so we won't have the data to show that for a few more years, but even if we do, it needs to be done at scale. But I believe that, make, that will make a difference. That will make a difference to how kids see the subject. That will make a difference to how kids learn the subject. Uh, so, think about that make sure that kids learn about these things and not just how to do things within them take take that away please everybody because that's what for me that's what it means to teach mathematics Sorry. can't really now top that uh, gonna no, I, yeah just gonna... i was just going to bring you in then atoll and say a huge 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 thank you because none of this would have been possible um, at all without your kindness, the way you reached out quite some time ago, the connection and and, and, and your generosity in, in, in sharing all of that as well. And so um, I wanted to say that and I wanted to make a point of doing that. And also it is just perfect that we finish on your takeaway for this evening so you can close the session. Yeah, I mean, I have, I suppose I have the benefit of everyone else's takeaway and, um, and the book as well. Um, it is, uh, yeah, it's just uh, raising another a point that you also made in the earlier Mass Chat Live that, like, 
idea in the secondary of proportional reasoning and proportion uh, isn't actually paradoxically there's six six odd hundred pages of that but once you've gone through it you see the same things appearing again and again and the area model is such a powerful model in showing multiplication you know for me the third bit really stood out that i'd never thought about but multiplication factorizing doing the inverse um it's when you understand like the big picture it doesn't seem as daunting as as these little disconnected bits it's actually less than you think it is um so that's um yeah that's that's my main takeaway is like the coherence makes something that's extremely daunting actually quite um, quite easily chunkable and uh, quite understandable um, so yeah I'm gonna finish up there I'll, I'll thank uh, the, some of our um, people on Twitter and Facebook uh, I'll mention uh, Karen's been commenting so I really look forward to your sketch note Karen thanks for also helping me debug some technical problems with my audio uh, thanks D um, on Facebook and Assad we didn't get to your question because it was very late but we'll uh, we'll try and address it in a, in a chat later so uh, thanks everyone for involved in uh, being involved and of course everyone for being here uh, i know it's a it's a live stream and can be feel a bit daunting as being live tv uh, so thanks for giving your time and um and uh, thanks again uh, pete for this uh, wonderful book so i'll just uh, finish the stream and then we'll have a very quick uh, debrief and goodbye so uh, we'll just do a quick wave so it looks uh, looks good on twitter